cold and you still can uh, slow down, relax, we go on with chapter 19 very quickly. There is a sort of monetary history that is described in chapter 19. If you want to blame it on somebody, it's on the British Parliament. They introduced 200 years ago the gold standard. So that is the start of it. But what he's running through is different regimes for, let's say, setting the value of your currency, what we call the exchange rate. Now we have a floating regime. But up through the history, we have had most of the time fixed rates. And it goes back to Bretton Woods. And that sounds like a golf course, but it isn't. It's a place in US where they met during the Second World War. When they were fighting in Europe, they were financing in the US. In Bretton Woods, they decided on the exchange rate uh, regime after the Second World War. They wanted it to be stable. So they wanted to stabilize uh, the economy by stabilizing the exchange rate. OK? It started with the gold standard in UK about 200 years ago, when they were fighting with Napoleon. And I'm afraid he lost. And it would be OK for Norway, but it wasn't OK for Denmark. And in those days, we were joined in a union with Denmark. So if you try to say that you are, let's say, the ancestor of Napoleon, don't say to the Norwegians, because they, that gave them, let's say, hard memories. But that was the start of it. Around the years of Napoleon, they decided in the British Parliament to stabilize the price level in the world. They had to have a gold standard. Simply means that if I print out a lot of money, there should be a possibility for those who have these notes and coins to go to the bank and get it in gold because they didn't want the coins and the notes. So that is the gold standard. So you had a certain amount of gold that you could pay back to those who have the money and say, OK, I'll take back the money. You get the gold. And they thought this would stabilize the price level in the world. Then we jumped to no, 100 years ahead. When is the interwar period? Is from 1918 to 1939. And the gold standard was introduced in the UK in 1817. So it's exactly 101 years to the interwar period starts. What do you know about the interwar period? It's a quite deep question. Yeah. Partly caused by the war in Germany partly caused by a financial collapse in US in October 1929, known as the Great Depression. It's called the Great Depression because it was in US. I think it was a, a deep one in Europe. But since it was not mentioned in American textbook, it's only known as the Depression. But the big one is in US in 1928. The problem was to get the world economy function again. How can it function? It's simply they trade. They need to trade more. How can they trade more? They have to produce more. What do you need to produce more? Sources. And labor. The problem was there was no, not a demand for these goods. There was a lot of, there were a lot of laborers willing to work, but never got the chance, simply because the economy was not functioning. And in this period, we have a gold standard, didn't help us, didn't speed up the economy. If you ask some of the economists, they will say we are in the same deep 
don't call it shit for something like it, right now, because there are a lot of people unemployed that could have worked if the world economy was, let's say, running more healthy than it is. OK? That was the start. Then ends the Second World War. N some of us would say in May 45. If you are from Asia, you will say from August the 9th, I think it is. Known for the last atomic bomb ever used in war over Nagasaki, which is a Japanese uh, major urban area. The first one was, was Hiroshima, which is the other one. <coughs> then the war was over. They had met at Bretton Woods, and they decided to control money floating in the world. And they established the International Monetary Fund. What is it used for? Or why do they use IMF? in Greece, in Spain, and in Italy is simply because they can get access to more money. So the monetary fund was a way to have an extra global federal reserve, so to speak, where they had money, where countries that needed uh, funding could get money. So not producing it by themselves, because that wouldn't solve the problem, but there could be an international funding system to fund it. So the idea was to avoid turbulence, to stabilize the exchange rates and the world price level. If you are from Africa or from developing countries, not necessarily the best you can do, but that is a different story. That will be told in International Economics Part 2 when you come back on your master program. OK. <coughs> what changed this was the only American president that had to leave office while being elected. He's known for uh, Watergate and for the ending of the Vietnam War. And his name is Richard Nixon. Nixon. Had he been vice president at any time? Yes. After the Second World War, uh, the American president was Harry Truman. He was succeeded by one of the most famous generals, American generals, during the war. His name was Eisenhower. His vice president for two periods was Richard M. Nixon. So he had been in politics before. And I think when it comes to ending the stable or the fixed exchange rate period, this is important. Uh, for those of you fond of American movies, and have seen Forrest Gump, you know they also play table tennis in this period. But you haven't seen it. Oh, you have, OK. What Nixon decides is we cannot longer guarantee the exchange rate of dollars. So over the night, he decides from now on, the dollar exchange rate will be floating. Imagine the shock of those who had dollars. One night they go to sleep and feel very rich. The next morning they wake up, and the president of US has decided that the dollar exchange rate is floating. And guess what way it went? Down. So if you were rich in the afternoon, you were not as rich the next morning. So this was a shock to the world economy. But it ended the Bretton Woods period with fixed exchange rates. So that is maybe one of the most important dates of monetary history in this world, 15th of August, 1971. 
And you, uh, if you ask me, where were you at the 15th of August, 1971? Well, I can say I was on a holiday somewhere in Norway, and I had no dollar. So I have not the faintest idea of the feeling, not the night before or the morning after. It was not a problem for me. And for most of the Norwegian, it wasn't. But this is the Nixon shock. He changed the exchange rate regime over the night. And you have to be a very arrogant American president to do that, I think. And if you haven't been the vice president for eight years under a general that uh, even uh, tried to contest the American military industry, then you are not arrogant enough. But I think he was, so he did it. And this changed the world monetary markets completely over one night. Because what US had promised was that at any time, if you had a dollar, you can come to American Federal Reserve and claim your go money worth in gold. Not a very nice thing to do if you are the American president. So the best way out of it is simply forget <coughs> the deal. We didn't mean it. We meant it on the 15th of August in the morning. But 12 hours later, forget it. We won't stick to it any longer. OK? What changes monetary market if the exchange rate is floating? Is You can choose your monetary policy. There are no link to, uh, let's say, fixed rate. So you are free to do that. S suddenly, it was a symmetry between the American money market and the rest of the world. It simply meant if the value of dollar is not 7.27 or something in Norwegian krona, it's up to the market to decide. So the money will float between the markets, simply because it's decided by the exchange rate. So if I get more out of my money at that time in German marks, I would take out my dollar and exchange them into German marks, and that would be better for me. So that was number two. <coughs> we get immediately exchange rate stabilization, simply because it's now not longer up to the American Federal Reserve to, let's say, get enough gold to change dollars. Now it's up to the markets. <coughs> and it's easier to get an external balance, because if it is too little money involved, then it will float into the market where you need more money and are willing to pay for it. And the interest rate goes up and the money floats in. And if the interest rate is going down at a certain stage, then they move the other way. So there is a free floating of money into the markets that you get most out of it. It's not decided by the Federal Reserve of the US. It's decided by those holding the money. And they are, let's say, uh, calculation of risk. I think in these days France had left NATO. So it's nothing to do with that. So don't blame it on NATO. How much do you know of macroeconomics? Not too much? Just a little bit? Okay. For those who have no knowledge in I think it's like this. Yeah. Or is it like this? I haven't taught this for 25 years. This is the production. You can either consume it or invest it. Or you can export it. 
then you reduce it, or you can import it, then you increase it. This we call external balance. It simply says import minus export, or vice versa. What happens to the national access to goods if you export more than you import? Since no one is answering, I think your knowledge of macroeconomics is not very impressive for the limit. OK. But it just says that there is a flow of goods between two countries. Flow out we call export. Flow in we call import. Import means it comes in. X, it, becomes, it leaves or export. It's just like exit, OK? This flows of goods has to be paid for. So if there are more goods floating out than in, in return comes more money in than goes out. Was that very difficult? There are more goods floating out if you export more than import. Okay. What we get in return is more money. Somebody pays for this, and this money comes back to home. So we lose goods, but get money. What on earth do we plan to use this money for? Put it in the bank. What do you do with your money that you have in your bank? One day you spend it. So what we simply do is this. In one period, if we export more than import, OK? Then money comes in. So if the balance is positive, money come back. comes in. We plan to use them in the future. So in the future, we can import more than we export, because we have the money to pay for the extra import. Do you see that? So it's an intemporal balance. So if there are periods where we have surplus, get the extra money, put it in the bank. So in the future, when we need more import, we pay with the money we have in the bank. We have two minutes to explain how did Norway use this in the 70s? Just a few days after the Nixon shock was simply like this. We now know that down there, under the water, deep down there, is petrol. Can we produce, let's say, the equipment to do that, to extract this from down there, up there, to Germany, or whatever, to sell it? No. How can we get it up? We invite in American companies with the technology, with the platforms, with the labor, all of it. So in this period, we import more than we export. So there is a negative. And money flows out. OK. Are the Norwegian prime minister worried? Because more and money floats out and disappears into the big American economy. And we might never see it again. No. Why are we not afraid? A few years later, let's say 1975, we are back here. What do we get for our export? Is money. How do we use them? Pay back the American that put money into the Norwegian economy. So we pay it back. Was it profitable? Because now we have a fund in Norwegian krona, a million, a billion, I think it's like that. Was it profitable to do this in the 70s? 
if you get all that money in the bank, would you think it was a nice thing to do? I hope you would say yes. So in periods where we need, let's say, what we do not have ourselves, but to improve our production potential, we might import this from out, or from foreign. Why do we do it? Is like they do in Brazil. In the future, when there is no Norwegian oil and gas, guess who will be sitting next to your table to negotiate prices for oil and gas? No, they are not speaking Norwegian any longer. But they can understand Portuguese because they come from Brazil. So this is what countries can do in periods where you lack capacity or lack knowledge or lack equipment, whatever it is. You can import it. You promise to pay it back if it's not Argentina, but that is a different story. You promise to pay it back. The reason why you do it is that in the future, your bank account could look like this. And guess how many Ferraris you can get for that one, Fabio? Or Porsches? Millions. Is it worthwhile? Of course. But in a period, you have a problem with the balance. And there could be change of your exchange rate. But in the future, things look much better. The problem is stay alive long enough. But that is a different story too, isn't it? Okay. So was it wise to do? Yes, it was. So in periods, we can use the monetary or money markets to get access to what we need. We promise to pay it back. And most of us will do sooner or later. OK? So there is a balance between two countries because of what we call macroeconomic uh, internal uh, situation. What did Norwegian do in the 70s was simply spending less money on Porsches and Ferraris. I think we, have, we had heard of a Lamborghini, but we have to wait 30 years before we bought one. Because then we are in 2005, and the first Norwegian Lamborghini is now rolling in to the Norwegian economy. So yes, this is the way to use the money market to fund or pay somebody who needs funding. So it's a balance between and the floating between them. So let's say France need to build a high-speed railway system. Do they have the money? No. Do they have the money in Germany? Yes. Could they lend them from Germany? Yes. So they did. Did they pay it back? Yes, they are. Would Germany uh, be afraid of the money? No, they are not. Because there is a floating between the money market that is stabilized with the new system. So that was all about macroeconomics. When you grow older, then you will learn much more about macroeconomics. But that is not in a course you are following in Norway. So send me a Christmas card when you know more about macroeconomics. You only need to write A, C, B, or D, whatever it is. I will soon understand what it is and who we're sending it, because I can see the stamps are not Brazilian. The German. Okay? What have we learned after 1973 or 71? <coughs> there are still external and internal shocks. So there are still shocks between countries and inside countries. We can call it the financial crisis, that is an external shock. Why is it external? Use your imagination. It's only Tuesday. You have still three more days before it's party time. Why is the financial crisis an external shock? Yeah, but where did it start? US. US. Do uh, they have problem in US? Yes. But is it only in US? No, in Spain, in Greece, and Italy. So it's an external shock. It comes from outside and influences the uh, Spanish, the Greece, the Italian, the French economy. 
So then it's external. It comes from abroad. Was it an internal shock in the US? And the answer is, of course. So it's both internal inside the economy, but also across the economy, because the money floats between the different economies. So you cannot insulate it, because it means, uh, let's say, hinder it. Normally, they use the money supply to, let's say, have a given inflation rate. If you go to Greece, is there a strong inflation pressure in Greece right now? Not very, because there are fewer and fewer buying something. So the inflation pressure is going down, OK? Let's go to Japan. None of you have been there. But you have a background that could have sent you. Yeah, OK. What is it about Japan is that they have had deflation. It means prices are going down. Who would invest into an economy where you expect to get less and less for what you produce? Not many. So what have Japan done to help the problem? Is like they do in the US print more money. What happens if people get more money? They buy more things. What happens to inflation if they have more money but the same things to buy? It goes up. So this is a way to solve problems like Japan, produce more money to get out of it. So then you can start from deflation to inflation. But that is specific to Japan. Most of the European countries have inflation problems. But not in Spain, not in Italy, and not in Greece, as long as there are high unemployment. We have still asymmetries between the US and the world. Part of it is explained by how do Brazil pay for their goods they buy in the world market is by dollars. How do Norway get their payment of oil and gas sold to Germany in US dollars. So the, the value of a barrel of oil is in US dollars. So there are asymmetries, because none of, not all of us can have, let's say, the world uh, currency. Can we get automatic stabilization? No because there are linkages out of the economy. So it didn't stop the problems. You still have external imbalances. If you don't believe me, call the Minister of Finance in China. Why do China have so much money? And who would lend them from China? China has a surplus on its export or on its uh, external balance. They get more and more money. Okay? Where could you put your money into if you are the Chinese Minister of Finance and have already spent all the money you can do in China? Okay? You can go to India, you can go to Brazil, you can go to... I don't think I would go to Russia, but that is a different story. But I could go to... Bangladesh yeah, to United States. United States. And there they go. Because US needs more money. And they gladly hire them. So yes, China has a surplus. US has a deficit. They need money. How do they get them? From Chinese banks, converted into dollars. So there are external balance, imbalance. You cannot balance uh, trade between countries using exchange rate, because it's up to the consumers in different countries. OK? So it's hard to solve problems across borders. One day, when you come back as the minister of uh, transport, let's say, in EU, you can tell me a lot about it, because you are trying to uh, coordinate policy across borders. Because there are still a Germany 
It's still a France. It's still a Netherlands. It's still Spain or Italy within EU. You are trying to coordinate the policy. If you ask me, and that is between us, it has not been the greatest success so far. And I do not say this because I have a son who is now living in Greece or in Spain. But I know somebody who's living there who's not very happy with the system. That's a different story. So it's not easy to solve problems across borders when, let's say, coordinating policies. Let's come to a conclusion. There will still be currency to be traded. There will even be new currency coming up. Because in the 90s, there was something they call écu. It's a French medieval currency. Why on earth do they call something that was so old? It was because they didn't have a name of it. Because now it's not called écu, but euro, which is the common currency of the EU. Not all of it, because I think 15 of the countries are members. Yeah. Yeah. Some are not allowed to be members, and some denies to be a member. And we can mention three. England. UK, yeah. Norway is not a member of EU. Sweden and Denmark. So not all of them would like to be part of this common market with a common currency. But it is a new currency, no doubt. Uh, if you go back 20 years, then you're in 1994, and we're trying to go into a French supermarket and say, I want to pay with a euro. If they didn't have a, let's say, uh, a warden with a gun, I would have tested it out. But if it was a police constable there with a big Kalashnikov, I would take my French into the pockets and go into the bank, or into the shop and buy it with French. So it's a new currency. And we can see more of them in the future. We don't know yet. There could be two different euros. Could be one solution to the problem. Don't ask me, I'm not a member. So I do, I just suggest, okay. There will still be domestic problems. And then we take this with us and say, over this textbook, there is only one solution to it, domestic policy instruments. So to solve domestic problems, you cannot use trade. If you try to do that, then you don't pass the exam. So you have to come back next semester. If you think that euro will have a fixed rate, not as long as I live, and then you will look at it, oh, that's only a few years, so that's no <laughs> problem. But still, my son could come back and tell you just the same. There are few reasons to believe that fixed exchange rate will be established again. Maybe in North Korea, how many of you buy North Korean goods on a daily basis? No. How many of you plan to go to North Korea? No. But I have my ex-brother-in-law was in North Korea. It's a different place, if you ask me. So if you want to go to a different place, go to North Korea, but have North Korean money with you. OK? There will be developing economies that try to solve the trilemma. And it will be up to them. There will be no international coordination of macroeconomic policy for developing countries. And then we are back to have they developed? Do they plan to have a common currency? Would that be vice of them? No. They are so different because This is rather big compared to this. 
although it's not very small, compared to this, or even this. This is a small country. Because in Brazil, it lives about 200. And in China, 1.34 billion. So it's just a small piece of China. You can put, let's say, 10 Chinese urban areas together, and that's Brazil. And they cannot use the same policy instruments, simply because they're different. And if they could have been equal, there is no rainforest in India. So their problems are different from India's. There could have been a lot of rainforest in India. But there are too many people in there, I think, who need wood to survive. So yes, there will be developing countries, but they will develop along different, uh, let's say, macroeconomic and international economic uh, strategies or policy instruments. But still will be gain uh, for in financial industries. Hadn't it been for one bank in US, this story would have been different. Because in October 2008, one of the big American banks collapsed. And what happened is the financial crisis. If you ask, I think you should ask Stieglitz, Joseph L. Stieglitz, what he thinks about that. And if you want a very should we say, outrageous economist, this could be the one. Why did it happen that US uh, bank or financial institution could create uh, money instruments like that? So the world economy collapsed. It's not because of EU, but of American policy. And that's the problem. But there still will be trade in assets. But I have a very good friend who uh, I was studying with. He's much richer than me. So I think he has at his disposal about 50 or 60 million Norwegian kroner. So he can invest into international assets. So uh, I think I met him in the spring of 2008, 2000, uh, summer of 2008, and we discussed, do you plan to invest into these derivatives? And he said, no, because I don't know what is the content of it. So the problem is that financial industry can come up with innovations. That sounds very nice, doesn't it? But it created the financial crisis. And that is the problem. And with an open system, you cannot avoid it. And here comes the next students, and they are five minutes ahead. So they still have to wait five minutes. Okay. Then we are back to the European experience. We call it the EU. And next week, since you are students from EU, not all of you, because some are from the EEA area. And none of the French know what EEA is. But it's not EU. OK. So since there are students coming in to follow a, a, a European exchange program, I'm sorry, we have to have Europe into the course. OK? So next week is my suggestion. You have three minutes to come up with complaints. Chapter 20. No objection? OK. As they say in the American course, overruled. Chapter 20. OK. Next week in the old building, at the late time of the afternoon, in the darkest part of this, uh, the college. But you are welcome back. And I promise to put the sound on if you don't want to attend. Have a nice weekend. Off.